Hey everyone, this is Music Tech Help Guy, and welcome to part 16 of my Music Theory for Producers course. In this video, we're going to talk about triad inversions. Again, if I happen to do it again by accident, I'm using the words triad and chord synonymously. Just remember that a triad is essentially a chord with just three notes specifically. So what are inversions? Well, inversions let us spell a chord differently than it might be spelled or voiced. Uh, and when I mean spelled or voiced, I mean that I'm talking about how the triad is arranged vertically. So something like this, this, and this. All three of those are C major. They're just voiced differently. So that we're talking specifically about how the uh, triads are voiced vertically. Most of the triads we've been working with so far have been in root position, which means that they have their root on the bottom, then the third, and then the fifth. So something like C major is, is spelled C-E-G. Let me go up an octave. Or A minor is A-C-E. Again, the root is on the bottom. Now you can actually rearrange the third and the fifth any way you want, or even add additional notes, but as long as the root is on the bottom, the chord is, co is considered root position. So let's take a look at some different inversions uh, that we can have of triads. So um, first, let me just uh, play in a, a C major triad here in root position. I'll do it on C3 here. And then this and this. Okay. So let's take a look at these in the score editor. So the very first one is root position like we had just talked about, where the root note C is on the bottom. So we have root, third, fifth. The second one here is called first inversion. So this is where your third, because remember E is the third of C major. The chord is still C, E, G. See, C is here, E, and G, but the C's been bumped up an octave, and now our E is on the bottom. So this is called first inversion. This is where your third of your triad is on the bottom. And the, the last example here is called second inversion. And in second inversion, uh, this means that your fifth is on the bottom. So the chord is still C, E, G. It's just voiced differently. It's just G, C, E, as opposed to C, E, G. So in all three of these chords, all three of these are a C major chord. They're just in three different forms, three different voicings, root position, first inversion, and second inversion. All right, so that's pretty easy. Let's do another one. Let's do uh, B flat major. So we've got B flat, D, F. That is a root position uh, triad. That's a root position B flat major triad. So to get to first inversion, you take your root and you bump your root up an octave. So instead of root third fifth, now we have third fifth root. Now for second inversion, you're going to bump both your third or your root and your third up an octave. So instead of root third fifth, we now have fifth root third. So root position, first inversion, second inversion. So the concept of inversions is pretty simple to understand. Let's talk about how they're actually used in music. Um, one really, really practical use for them. Let me go ahead and turn off step input here and pull up my, my keyboard here so you can see what I'm playing. Um, one really practical use for them is making the performance and transition of chords easier to play on the piano. And it also makes the voice leading between chords smoother. So for example, if I play one and four in C major, that's a C chord and an F chord, um, with both chords in root position, it's going to look like something like this. That's a lot of jumping around for my right hand. If I respell the four chord to second inversion, not only does it, it's, is, is it going to sound nicer, it's also going to be easier to play. So here's one in root position, four in second inversion. So again, it sounds better from a voice leading standpoint, um, and also just it makes it a lot easier to play. Let's take a look at this on the staff just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. So I'll go ahead and play this in with step input. And 
and then we will pull up our staff here. There we go. So this is one in four in root position. See that big jump there? Here's one in four with four in second inversion. Much easier to play. And also the notes don't have to travel as far. Here we've got every single note jumping up a fourth to get to that chord. Here, the G just goes up one step, the E goes up a step, and the C stays the same. So this is an example of good like voice leading um, and proper voice leading. This is the typical way you'd play one four at the piano. Not this, unless you're intentionally trying to create this uh, big jumped uh, motion. Let's look at another one. Um, let's take a look at uh, A minor. And instead of one four this time, let's do one five. So I'm going to play two different versions. Let me pull up the piano just so you can see what I'm what I'm playing here. So this is, by the way, this is a major five. This is a dominant five in A minor. So that's one five one in root position. Um, this time I'm going to play the five chord in first inversion, and it's going to make it a lot uh, a lot easier to play. So let's take a look at that in the score editor. So one to five is a big jump. All three notes are having to jump up a fifth. So that's a big jump for your right hand. One, five, one. One, five, one here, basically the top note E stays the same. And the bottom two notes basically just have to go down a diatonic step and back up. Let me just stick these in the staff. I'll go up an octave just so it looks better. But yeah, you can see here it's a lot, uh, it's a lot, it sounds a lot, not only does it sound a lot smoother, but it's a lot, it's a heck of a lot easier to play. Um, the jump almost like from root position chord to root position chord almost is too drastic of a jump, you know? So this is, these are just two very common examples of using here first inversion and the previous one in second inversion to make a, to take a chord and, and invert it to just make the performance not only sounds smoother and the voice leading sounds smoother, but also, again, it makes it easier for your right hand to play rather than jumping around like this. Now, whether you call the overall chord progression root position or an inversion depends on what the bass or bottom note is. And these last two examples, I've just been playing the right hand. So let me play uh, two more examples of the 1-5 progression in A minor, but I'm going to add in the left hand and that, so the left hand is going to be the bottom note, and uh, I'm going to play the bottom note, uh, the bottom, the bass in three different ways. All right, so I've played in my three different examples. Uh, example one is measure one and two. Example two is three and four, and example three is five and six. So let's listen to these back to back, just so you can get an idea of what they sound like. Everything that's in the bass clef is my left hand, and everything in the treble clef is my right hand. Um, I am playing it up an octave from last time, but it's the exact same idea it's a a root position um one chord with a first inversion five chord but again that's just the right hand we're going to take a look at what the left hand is doing and we're actually going to refer to these chords in a little bit different way that's example one example two okay so I said earlier is in order to determine what the overall harmony of a chord is, you actually have to look at what the bass or the bottom note is doing. So even though the five chord in each one of these is in first inversion, each one of these five chords is not actually in first inversion. Um, if you look at the first one, we have an E in the bass, which is the root of the E chord. That's the five chord, E, G sharp, B. It's an E major chord. Um, even though the right hand is in first inversion, the bass is still the root of the chord. So this overall harmony here is still going to be referred to as root position. Whereas if we look at the second one here, we've got, again, first inversion in the right hand with G sharp, the third, uh, and the bottom. But also the bass has G sharp on the bottom. So the G sharp is the third of the E chord. So this is first inversion because the third is in the bass. And then the last one is second inversion because we have B in the bass, which is the fifth. 
So again, the right hand is in first inversion, but the left hand is playing the fifth of the chord. So root position, first inversion, and second inversion. So again, it's very common for the right hand of the piano to play inverted spellings of chords, but still have the bass or left hand following the root position. Even if additional notes are added to the left hand or to the right hand, you still have to look at what the bottom note is to see what the overall harmony is. And inverted chords can be anywhere. It's really up to the composer as to when they want to use them. Yes, there are some common ways uh, and common times they're used. Um, you know, they're normally used like the last few examples, but it's really up to the composer to choose what tonal co color or character they're looking for. Let's look at some other examples of popular music. So first, let's look at a simple one. Adele's Hello, uh, the chords for this are E minor, G, D, C. Um, this is 1, 3, 7, 6, if you're following along in Roman numerals, but the right hand of the G chord is actually in second inversion so that the, the hand doesn't have to jump up a whole fourth or a whole third to go up to uh, G major. So instead of G, B, D is the spelling in the right hand, you have D, G, B. Now, I, I threw this one in here um, just to show you that using inversions in the right hand, but then still using the root note in the left hand or in the bass is extremely common. Um, because in this song, even though the right hand is playing a second inversion triad, the left hand is still playing the root note G. So technically, overall, this harmony is still considered a, a root position G chord. It's just that the right hand's been voiced differently um, so that you don't have to have this that big jump. So just so you can hear it with the jump, I'll pull the D up an octave. This is with, with the right hand doing the jump. And it's not even really going from E minor to G that's the problem. It's going from G all the way down to D. That's that's the problem. You get these two, you know, one kind of big jump and one really big jump. To me, too much um, motion like that, parallel motion like that, tends to sound kind of stale to me. You know, throwing in an inversion here and there can actually make the voicing sound a lot better. a lot smoother too. By the way, if you're wondering why it sounds so high, the, I've got the whole thing up an octave from where the, the original song is just for sake of demonstration. Let's look at an example of where an inversion is actually used and followed by the bass. A good example of this is the chorus of Let It Be by the Beatles. The progression goes A minor, uh, C major, but second inversion, so you can see that the G is in the bass, F major, C major in root position, um, C major again, G major root position, um, we have F major, and then we have another C chord, but this one's first inversion. You can see that the E is in the bass, and then we have a D minor chord, and then C root position again. So we have two different um, instances of a C chord where um, he's using, you know, second inversion over here and first inversion over here. So this is used to keep this sort of downward bass movement moving, because if he didn't go A down to G down to F, you wouldn't have this sort of stepwise downward bass motion motion. You'd have A going down to C and then going back up to F, which still sounds good, but it doesn't have that downward um, moving bass motion. And the same thing goes over here. Instead of starting on A and moving down, it starts on F and moves down. So again, here instead of using the G, he uses the E to move downward sc uh, scale-wise all the way from G all the way down to C in a scale-wise motion without using just the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 chords. He substitutes the three chord for a first uh, first inversion uh, one chord instead to make the harmony a little bit more interesting. So again, in both cases, this is to keep the downward uh, bass movement. So this just makes the overall harmony more interesting and also allows the composer some freedom to play around uh, with, with the bass movement. All right, so that's the basics of inversions and a few examples in popular music. 
In the next video, we're going to jump into how to read um, chord symbols and how to read, because we've already, we know how to read the basic ones. We know how to distinguish major, minor, diminished, and augmented uh, chord symbols, but I also want to show you how to um, write and uh, interpret uh, inverted chords as chord symbols. So we'll get into that in the next video. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.